12.02 it is. Um, again, my name is Ross. I'm a librarian with the King County Law Library. Welcome to Research the Law. Uh, today we're focusing on estate planning. Uh, it's an ongoing series, Research the Law. We're uh, devoted um, to researching the law, uh, focusing on remote databases such as NOLO, which we'll be talking about today, and other online resources as well. Um, also on the presentation today, we have Evelyn Emanuel, a local attorney. She's going to be talking in the second half of the hour. Uh, if you found out about this webinar um, uh, and you're coming from elsewhere, we will be talking largely about King County specific things. But um, I know that Clark and Pierce County also have the NOLO database. So if you're from another county, welcome. Um, we're happy to have you. Um, some general webinar disclaimers. So let's get over into the presentation area. Um, so here I'm going to start sharing my screen. All right, you should be able to see the King County Law Library website homepage. Um, so today we are using Adobe Connect. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting software for, for classes because you can have different pods and so in the presentation area i'm currently sharing our website but there are other pods as well you can see there's the download file uh pod so right there i have put in the nolo uh, titles that we're going to be looking at today um, so you can say uh, what what options are there out there for estate planning in nolo well open up that file and you can take a look for the format of the class, uh, I'll say uh, up front, I'm going to show you a, a little bit around uh, KCLL's site, our website, show you a database uh, in the way of NOLO. Um, that's going to take about 20, 25 minutes, at which point Evelyn's going to take over, um, give you a little bit more substance talking about estate planning. Uh, if you're just beginning to think about estate planning, or maybe you're very familiar, but you need more tools. My hope with this class is that you're empowered with more resources and you're able to, you know, fully take charge. Um, the databases I'll be discussing have plenty of information on wills, power of attorney, uh, healthcare directives, things like that. Uh, there's also forms and helpful information about the courts. Before I get going, though, I'd like to hear from you um, to keep this as interactive as possible. Since estate planning, it, you know, as a category, it's so broad. Um, what type of information are you looking to get specific out of this? Are you looking for power of attorney? Are you looking for trusts or wills? What, if you could throw that into the Q&A pod, that way I could try to tailor it as much as possible. All right. Um, someone said trusts. That's good to know. All right. Someone says wills. Someone says trusts. All right. And personal planning. All right. These are all really good answers. So um, I'll try to tailor my approach with that. I know that Evelyn also has a good amount. There's a lot of people asking for trusts, and she's going to touch on that a good amount because trusts are a very lawyerly topic. Um, so I'm going to try to tailor what I'm talking about as well. So with uh, my screen share, you should be able to see the King County Law Library homepage. Um, just some things to note about the law library. So first of all, we're going to be closed, as you can see, next Monday in observance of Memorial Day. Uh, but other than that, on our website, there's a lot of good DIY type legal information. So I mean, just for the library itself, you can see that there's services available. And so um, this is just a quick snapshot of all that we do. We do form packets. So we do um, transfer on death deed packets. Actually, I'll click over and show you. So we have a lot of probate packets. So there's transfer on death deed. We have uh, about filing a will as well as for later on in these types of processes, uh, actually opening and closing probate, as well as many other form packets, such as um, uh, how to evict somebody, how to start a civil lawsuit in court, um, how to file a default judgment, claim against a contractor's bond. A lot of form packets available. So these are available under the forms tab on our website. 
very DIY focused. Uh, I'll also show you very briefly our videos page. We have a lot of captured webinars that we've done in the past, as well as our famous what to expect when series where uh, if you're filing a family law motion, it can be complicated. We have attorneys talking about uh, what it entails and you know what to look out for, what to expect when. Probably um, most pertinently for today under the databases tab, you can see actually there's a drop down, but I'm going to click on the databases tab to, to show all the databases that we have available. Um, so first we have eBooks, which are available uh, available exclusively to our attorney subscribers or just subscribers in general. Anybody can subscribe to the to the law library, which lets you check physical books out and gets you a discount on things like document delivery, where we scan, you know, chapters of books to you. Um, but it also unlocks eBooks. Um, subscription to the library is hundred dollars a year. Just going to throw that out there. Um, but this eBook library is really great. We're always adding more volumes to it because um, you know with COVID we saw that we wanted to be built out as much as possible so people don't have to physically come into the library. But beyond the eBooks um, or the Lexis Nexus digital library, I should say there are other eBooks available for everybody in the way of Vital Law. Um, this is a Walters Kluwer service. Uh, it was formerly known as Cheetah, but now it's Vital Law. Um, then there's NOLO, which we're going to be taking a deep dive into today. The National Consumer Law Center uh, Digital Library. This is really fantastic if you're interested in consumer law, if you're thinking about getting a mortgage, if you're going through bankruptcy or debt collection. Uh, their volumes are um, very thorough. There's also Hide Online. Um, my understanding is that this is currently only working in the library. I'm not sure if, yep, it's only in library. So you'll have to be using our IP addresses to access it, but they have a lot of law reviews, law journals, things like that. Uh, up here is also a trial offered by Westlaw. Westlaw is kind of the premier legal database, I would say, or one of them. I actually teach a whole hour long class on Westlaw, which I'll be doing in, August, I believe. Um, stay tuned for that. But Westlaw, anyway, is extremely powerful if you're researching case law. They have tons of legal treatises published by West, such as uh, Washington Practice. Um, very, very valuable. Generally, uh, it's also very expensive, but right now they're evidently offering a 14-day free trial. You're going to call an 800 number to learn more about that. It's not administered by us, this trial, so we're kind of just advertising it for folks. Uh, and that's also true as well for FastCase and Case Text. These are similar to Westlaw it's for researching case law um, and the like. But most pertinently, like I said, we're going to be looking at NOLO. NOLO, uh, it's a collection of largely do it yourself DIY books looking at a variety of topics. They have, you know, how to beat your traffic ticket, how to start a living trust, things like that. So on our website, again, going from the databases tab to NOLO, um, you can see here that there's a table of contents type thing. The, the database, uh, as it were for NOLO, is just a collection of eBooks, right? So these are all the titles that we have for NOLO. Um, and then, like I said, in that downloads pod that you have available to you in Adobe Connect, you can see I handpicked the titles out that are related to estate planning specifically. Uh, so that's a good way to go, go about doing that. So NOLO is free to access. You can access it at home, but what you're going to have to do is uh, become either a subscriber. Like I mentioned, the subscriber program is $100 a year. Um, really, really great service. But you could also just be a registered guest with the library, which is free, um, and let you get into the Walters Kluwer Vital Law as well as NOLO. So from the NOLO page, you can see I clicked into this link. Talks about joining KCLL. And then from here, you can click learn more and join. So you're basically just filling out a form and it's going to give you a library 
card number. It's virtual. You won't be getting a physical card, but that'll let you log on. So once you receive that, you fill out that form. It gives you a library card number. I already have a library card number, as it were. So I'm clicking on Go. OK, well, usually it'll ask you for your library card number, and you'll click Log On. There's no password. You just put in your number. But it had saved my information. So here we are at the NOLO kind of home screen. Um, I guess maybe it, j just to backtrack about NOLO, you might have heard of it. My first exposure to NOLO was their printed books. So we have a lot of their printed books in our library. Back when I worked for municipal libraries, they were kind of the go-to legal reference book that we had available. I, I would recommend it, generally speaking. Um, my impression, though, back in the day was that these were so general as to not be helpful. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, if you're talking about writing a living trust or something like that, it's incredibly specific and in in many ways intellectually demanding. But in flipping through it, it's 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 very accessible. Now, I'm happy to report that my previous my my first general impression is not really true. That a lot of these books are they do get specific enough as to be incredibly helpful, and a lot of them have. Um, forms, like actual forms that you can just, uh, from here, you can print or email to yourself, and I'll show you how to do that. Um, but they're they're very specific. They're incredibly helpful. Um, you know, Evelyn will talk about times when, you know, an online form is maybe not the way to go. But um, anyway, I, I'm continually impressed with NOLO. So there's a couple ways to go about browsing this uh, this database of ebooks. Uh, the first and most obvious way you can see on this page there are um, categories laid out. You know, business and corporations, rights and disputes. Hey, look, wills and estate planning. So um, let's click on that. I'll say I'm talking about. There's two ways to go about searching. Uh, or finding ebooks. One is these categories, the other one's going to be using that search bar at the top. We'll be taking a look at that in a second. Clicking on wills and estate planning, you can see that there's subcategories uh, estate planning, executors, wills and power of attorney. A lot of people had said trust and living trust. So let's give living trust a click. So now that we're in the living trust subcategory, you can see that these, these are actual titles of books. So these are books that you can open right away on your computer. So I'm gonna click on Make Your Own Living Trust. So we're in the book called How to Make Your Own Living Trust. Um, where, you know, I, I, I spoke up for Nolo and said how valuable it can be and they have great forms and really good information. Uh, this is one of the caveats that I'm going to talk about today is that we've opened the book, but it doesn't look like a book. Um, <laughs> it doesn't look like an ebook. It looks like a bunch of kind of garbled text, and you can see chapters, but they're out of order. Uh, it's, it's, it's somewhat bizarre, but <laughs> I'm going to show you how to make sense of this and how you can interpret it as a book uh, as you go forward. So looking at these results, search results, I guess, um, this HJMM8J at the top, I guess that means how to make your own living trust. That's how they code it. Um, but we know that we just clicked on that link, so we know that we're looking at this book. The first thing that I'm going to do is there's this relevance tab right here. It's for sorting. I'm going to sort by, I think source is the best way to do it. I'm going to click it again. Okay, so it does the forms first for this one. But you can see that the forms are listed um, alphabetically, alphanumerically, whatever, where form one is first, and then it descends from there. And then after the forms, you can see it starts with chapter one, overview of living trusts. So let's give that a click. You could see from that page that we could click on PDF full text, and that option is present currently to the left. But there's also other uh, 
good bibliographic information on the chapter, you can see that we are indeed looking at Make Your Own Living Trust. You can see who the author is. Then there's options to the right for uh, different tools, which we'll be looking at more carefully in a minute. But more immediately, you know, if you're opening an ebook, you probably want to read it. We're on chapter one. Let's click on PDF full text. From here, it actually opens uh, probably what you were expecting to begin with, where this looks like a book. Uh, it's chapter one. Uh, it's a PDF, so you can scroll down and just read it like it were a document on your computer. Um, note that it is just chapter one. So if you want to read chapter two, you're going to have to um, go over to this panel on the left where you can see we're in chapter one. You're going to have to navigate around and find chapter two. Honestly, I find it easier just to back out to the previous menu and find chapter two that way. Uh, but you can click on it, you know, and we're in chapter two. You can read it like it were a document on the page. Um, from here, we see those same options that we saw on the bibliographic page where you can print or email or save um, the uh, save. Sorry, is this one um, this chapter? I think that's really helpful if you're reading it and you say, actually, I want to read it later, or I want to keep it for myself. You can click the print icon and then start printing. There's probably a better way to do that. So I'm going to click the back button on my mouse on my computer, get back to that bibliographic page, and then previously to that large. Uh, overview list. So here you can see um, all the chapters. If you've read through this, or maybe you just know from the chapter headings, you know, what you, what you want to read about. So look to the right here, there's this folder tab. If you click that, it starts saving things to your folder. It's almost like a cart on Amazon to where you're adding things uh, to a folder that you can later um, deal with. So let's just quickly add some things to the folder. Oh, that looks good. That looks good. That looks good. All right. So all of these chapters are in our folders. And actually, you know, probably pertinently, a lot of you are probably looking for forms. So living trust for one person, I'm going to add that to my folder as well. So now at the upper right hand corner, just like on Amazon, there's our folder. Click that. It's like going to our cart and you can see all the articles or sections that we had previously saved. Now from here, we can print all of it. We can email all of it. We can save all these to our own computer or device. Um, or you could just browse them this way, where you can click in and read the PDF full text now that you have all of your pertinent information saved together. I think this is a really, really easy way. I think that folder um, option is not utilized enough just because you can really hone in. Um, and, and it's true that you can gather these articles or the, these files from other books. So if you were looking at the Living Trust book, you could also add in to your folder articles from the, um, you know, how to write a will book or something like that. So you can gather them all in one place, email them all to yourself, save them all to your device. Uh, it makes it very, very easy, and, and that's, I think, one of the best ways to use the NOLO software. I'll also highlight going back to the home page by clicking this Legal Information Reference Center. You almost think it would say NOLO or something to that effect, but um, that brings us back to this home page. So I just showed you how to browse by category, so you can just you know click around. I think that's probably the easiest and best way to do it. But if you're looking for something very, very specific, or you just prefer to do it this way, you can use the search box. So here you can type in, you can see I've previously typed for mediation or estate plan or wills. Uh, you can use this just like you would any other search box. Think of whatever you're looking for, type into there and click search and see what happens. Um, completely valid, but for the sake of getting the most out of the software right now, I'm going to click into advanced search to show you something really great where you can, they have different search modes. Um, they have smart text searching, which I think is like an AI type thing. I don't know. Um, 
But what I want to show you here is I'm going to, in the search box, I'm going to say uh, estate plan or wills. And then I'm going to say under document type, look for form. So it's in this lower part of the screen. It says document type. You have to scroll down a little bit, but then I find the word form. So this is going to be looking for um, estate plan documents or will document that are specifically forms, which you know Nolo has previously gone in and, and tagged it that way. So searching that way, it gave 118 responses. You know, a lot of these are probably not going to be relevant. I think that estate plan or wills is probably still a very generic search uh, phrase. But that just goes to show one way that you can go about doing this. Um, I think that looking at them like they were books, like we were doing and seeing the bibliographic pages and going chapter by chapter, I think that's probably the best way to go, just because if you're looking for um, living trust, you know, it's incredibly specific. Why not just look at the living trust book? Um, and it makes sense just to, to read as much as you can, in my opinion. But searching another valid um, way to go about doing that. Another thing specifically for this class, a lot of the research the law classes that we offer are going to focus on databases that we offer, <clears throat> which makes sense, like NOLO or the National Consumer Law Center. Um, but another thing that I wanted to show you is a website called Washington Wills. So Washington Wills, uh, you know, there's a lot of <laughs> ads for people who want to uh, make a will for you, but it's actually a free website, uh, or the actual hyperlink URLs, uh, wa-wills.com. So clicking that, I'm going to exit out of NOLO. Um, a lot of people had asked about wills specifically when I when I asked earlier, and, and this is a really good we resource where if you have a very complicated estate, Something like this is probably, you probably want to talk to a lawyer, right? If you have a very complicated estate, it's usually worth the, the time and expense to consult with somebody whose bread and butter is drafting wills um, and the like. But if you have a very simple estate, uh, it's possible that you can do it yourself. And so that's why this website exists. It was created by an attorney. Um, so here they have a, their homepage where you can talk to their law firm, there's a glossary, but what we're looking at right now is the write a document tab. So clicking on get started there, they have, um, they're developing more instructions. Looks like they're doing a power of attorney, healthcare directive, um, but you're gonna click on write your simple will. There's a lot of text explaining that they're not your attorneys, that's not legal advice, etc. kind of a, um, covering themselves type of thing. Then there's a legal assessment. So it's gonna be asking if you already have a will, what age are you, you know, are you physically, you know, in a, are you capable of, of doing this? Um, do you have very complicated situations such as property outside the United States? This is all to ascertain, is a simple will that you can draft online? Is this for you? So, uh, if you answered yes to one of them, it, I think it's going to say, you know, probably talk to an attorney or something. Yep, talk to an attorney. But if you answer no, your state's very simple. You can click on continue, and it's going to give you instructions on how to draft. Um, gives you a lot of, you know, actually writing this. How's it going to go? And then from there, you're just going to keep on clicking continue and reading it, and then it's going to show you all the different clauses that you might want to include. And then it's going to talk about what it should look like, maybe what yours could include. Um, you know, I'm kind of glossing over the fact that you're going to have to read all these pages and it, it is an effort in a way, but it is a great resource for doing a will on your, on your own. I hear from people all the time that they're able to get it done this way. Um, and then at the end, you know, it, it kind of walks you through the whole process. So I think Washington Wills is a great resource. I'm going to show you two more online resources that I think are super valuable. 
and they're both on the website Washington Law Help. So Washington Law Help is a it's a nonprofit website that's maintained by a group of attorneys um, who operate under it. It's the Northwest Justice Project. So the Northwest Justice Project maintains Washington Law Help. Uh, can't say enough good things about these folks and uh, all the resources they have. But two um, DIY kits that they have for free on their website are uh, Durable Power of Attorney and Healthcare Directive. So I'm going to go to Durable Power of Attorney. My understanding, I'm not an attorney, so I can't exactly tell you what your rights are, etc. But my impression is that this you want a durable power of attorney because uh, durable means it continues after you're in incapacitated. And that's usually what people want in these situations. So they have a um, little Q&A section talking about, do I want this? Do I need this? Blah, blah, blah. And then at the bottom, it says download packet and fill out forms. So they have a form for, uh, and look, they have the same kind of Q&A to start, but they have a fill in the blank, durable power of attorney for finances, that uh, and, and for healthcare, they have two different ones that a lot of people use, and they have a rev revocation form as well. Then I realize I'm kind of going over time, so I'm going to briefly show you that there's the healthcare directive slash living will on their website as well. Um, it's the same thing where they have a Q and A to start or an FAQ saying, is this for me? And then it gives you the forms after that um, and the instructions on how to fill out the forms. These, uh, see them almost daily in the law library. A lot of people are using these, so I would definitely recommend checking out Washington Law Help for living wills uh, or healthcare directives and power of attorney forms, as well as many other situations as well. And then there's that WA Wills website for a DIY simple will. Um, that is the end of my spiel, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Evelyn. Just one moment. Oh, yeah, and Q&A, sorry. Let's see. Okay, so for NOLO, somebody had asked, is there a way to search for just Washington forms? There's not a, like, a metadata way where, like, um, you know, there's metadata to signify that something was a form, right? So we were able to search by just forms. Um, there's nothing like that to search for just Washington forms, unfortunately. You, uh, for that, I would encourage you to include Washington in your search term. Um, so when you're searching at the top, include the word Washington, and that, that'll accomplish it that way. But there's no, like, hardwired way, unfortunately, just to do that. How safe is the personal information you enter on a screen? Uh, that's a really good question. I think that Washington Wills, you're basically kind of downloading text in a way. I don't think that any information stays on their side. I think that's uh, definitely something to be aware of. You know, I think that's a great question to ask and to be cognizant of as you're kind of looking at these DIY things online. I'll also say that... Um, for Washington Law Help, you're downloading a PDF. So there's also the PDF is a kind of static file that's not communicating back to the mothership. Um, I would also encourage you if you're if these are the uh, types of things that you're worried about, uh, our computers at the law library uh, we have um, ten in Seattle. Um, they are set up to uh, basically completely erase the hard drive after you're done using them. Um, that's just to ensure that on the uh, local side that nothing is uh, preserved or anything like that. It's a hard reset. Someone says, does Law Library have a list of attorneys who can review DIY forms for accuracy? Unfortunately, we don't. There's like We don't have a personal list, like a list of people. And then beyond that, um, we can't, as librarians, unfortunately... Um, uh, like review forms, we're not attorneys. I think that the best shot for that would be, uh, maybe Evelyn can speak to this uh, when, when um, she gets on, but I think that 
it might be just contacting the bar association and the bar association will pl play matchmaker with uh you know if, if you tell them what you're looking for like having a attorney review your documents they'll match you with an estate planning attorney who specializes in that or something like that um so that's that's how i'd go about doing it unfortunately nobody in the law library itself can help in that way well, while it's loading uh let me just introduce myself uh, my name is Evelyn Emanuel. I'm an estate planning attorney in Seattle. Um, so we're going to talk about some estate planning documents and discuss why you need them. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what the document is, and I have a few like, you know, what, what laws apply. What happens if you don't have one? Uh, and then kind of what to worry about, like, so why you might need one. Uh, well, just, you know, and if you end up drafting it yourself, some, some stuff to be concerned about. Okay. Um, let's see. So I had the obligatory lawyer joke there. A teacher asked her class the following question. A woman dies at $10 million estate. She was a tenth to her house cleaner. Quarter to her brother, a third to her son, and the rest to charity. What does everyone get? Of course, it's a lawyer. So, okay. Uh, disclaimer. So this is just a, this talk doesn't create an attorney-client relationship. So I'm just uh, giving a, a very uh, bird's eye view of, of some of this stuff. Okay, and uh, just to make, Ross, are you there? I am, yes. Okay, I just want to make sure, you can hear me, right? Yep. Okay, I just wasn't sure I was talking into the void. Okay. Now so, it feels that way. <laughs> okay, so I just want to acknowledge this can be a hard topic to talk about. It's a, it's a difficult thing to think about, but it really is a good idea to, to do this stuff, to get these these documents in order so your family doesn't have to, to make decisions that would be difficult for them after you die. Um, and it can, it can just make dealing with your state a lot uh, a lot less complicated for your uh, for your beneficiaries or your family. Okay, so should you do them online? Um, well, Russ just gave you a bunch of really great uh, resources. Uh, I love Washington Law Help. I think Washington Wills is a great website. I think the big thing here is uh, that like they are they are cheaper, but the and, and like they can be a totally a good option. There are a lot of companies out there who offer this sort of stuff. So if you are going to do the, your estate planning documents online, I would really recommend using a Washington, uh, a Washington site because a Washington site is going to have an awareness of what Washington's laws are. Uh, and that can vary a lot from state to state. So like if you know someone in California, they might have everything in a trust for their estate because probate is really expensive and difficult in California. In Washington, it's not. It's pretty straightforward. It's not expensive. And so we have to do a lot less with like trusts and making estates more complicated stuff. So, you know, using a Washington site is probably my big advice there. And then if your estate's more complex, like you have a large estate, you have someone with special needs you want to leave stuff to, you have a non citizen spouse, you want to disinherit somebody. Uh, if you're concerned about will contests, if you have minor children, it's probably a good idea to talk to a lawyer. Okay, so like I said, we're going to talk about some commonly used uh, documents. And I'll mention a few other things. So your typical estate plan will have a will, a tangible personal property list, a power of attorney. The, the durable power of attorney is just like a general financial one. Then you can have a healthcare power of attorney and a healthcare directive. And I'll talk about what those mean. Here are some other documents, trusts, community property agreements, disposition remains, like some other, some other things there. I can talk, I can talk a, a bit more about those if anyone has any questions. Okay, well, so here's sort of a, a grand example of a will. Essentially, you're distributing your property and you're going to say who you want to take care of your kids. And wills often will have a, um, a, a trust in them to deal with a specific situation. Okay, your requirements. You must be 18 years of age and you must be of sound mind. Sound mind is not a high bar. You have to know who you are, what you have to give, and who you want to give it to. So you could have someone who is starting to have sort of diminished capacity, maybe someone who's getting a little bit older, uh, but they might still be of sound mind. Okay, formalities. Washington's strict on formalities. So you have to have it in writing. It has to be signed. It also has to be signed by two witnesses or your will has to be accompanied by an affidavit signed by two witnesses. 
it's not a bad idea to do both of those things, to have your will signed by two witnesses and then also to include an affidavit with your will. The affidavit is a document where your two witnesses swear that they were the ones who signed your will and then you have it notarized. That way, if, um, if someone contests your will or someone says that your will is not genuine, then the affidavit is sort of a document. It's, it's self-proving. You can say, no, no, no. You can, it's a, a legal document. You can show the court to say, no, this is legitimate will. Oh, I should also mention, um, in January of this year, the Washington's Electronic Wills Act came into effect. So now witnesses can be electronically present, uh, which is a little cutting edge in Washington. They're usually a little more conservative. Uh, I, don't, I don't know a whole lot about it. There are some differences with it. Uh, like you might use a declaration instead of an affidavit. Uh, and there's a, there's a custodian requirement that I'm still a little unsure about. So, um, so there is sort of some, some wiggle room with some of this because of the electronic wills, just to, just so you're aware. Okay, a codicil. So someone asked about amending their will. So it also has to be a writing signed by the testator and the two witnesses are an affidavit. So all the same formalities are required for a codicil, for an, an amendment to your will. So it's, I always say it's probably best just to do, to do a new will so that you know that any changes are consistent with your overall estate plan. Uh, it, it doesn't really tend to be cheaper to, to add an amendment on unless it's really, really minor. So um, yeah, I can, I can answer any more questions on that if anyone has any. Okay, if you don't have a will, so Washington has an estate plan for you. It's called intestacy. So Washington has a plan for what happens with your assets. We're a community property state. So if you're married, your spouse gets all the community property and then the spouse gets half of the separate property and then the kids will get the other half of the separate property. If there aren't any kids, the spouse gets three quarters of the separate property and the other quarter goes to the decedent's parents and siblings. If there are no kids, parents, or siblings, then all the separate property goes to the surviving spouse. If you're not married, all your stuff goes to your kids. If you don't have kids, then to your parents. If no parents, then siblings. If no siblings, then kids of siblings. Then they go to grandparents and descendants of grandparents. So there's this whole like you know list of people that stuff would go to. So a good argument for doing a will is if you know you're maybe estranged from your brother or sister and you don't want your assets to go to that person. Uh, so your heirs take by representation, just real quickly, what that mean, it means is that everyone in the same generation gets the same percentage of your estate. So here, A dies. If B, C, and D are all alive, they each get a third of the estate. If C and D have died, then B still gets a third, and then all the grandkids, E, F, G, H, and I, they would all get two-fifteenths or an equal share of A's estate. So it's, it's by generation. Um, so it's not that like C's two kids would split their share and D's three kids would split their share. Okay. So what to worry about with intestacy, like I was saying, it may result in an outcome that you're not happy with. So if you, if you have things that you're concerned about there, then, I mean, like the law tries to give your things to the person or people that they would assume you would want stuff to go to, but you know, that's not the same for everybody. Um, so if you if you're if you're drafting your own will, careful about who you name as a personal representative. It should be someone who is responsible with money and who will do things like file taxes and finish everything up in the way that they're supposed to. It's not a great idea to name two people as the personal representative because that makes things you have, they have to agree on things and that just can make things a little bit more difficult. So it's it's a good idea to name one person. And if say you have two kids, name one as the first and then name the second kid as the alternate personal representative. So if the first one can't serve the second one. So I, I say that because when you're drafting your estate planning documents, how you name people is sort of your last statement on what they meant to you, right? And so if you have three kids, you can't name them all as the personal representative. And so, you know, like just naming the oldest and then maybe explaining to your kids in a letter, like why you named the oldest and then the second oldest and then the third oldest. You know, they're like, I named this person because they live closer or, or whatever. Um, when someone dies, uh, all of the bad family dynamics that may have existed are hugely exacerbated. So think a little bit about who you're choosing for different jobs and maybe 
think about explaining why you chose them for different jobs. Okay, the other thing, you don't know what you don't know. So if there is something complicated about your estate and you don't realize it, you may get an outcome you don't like. Okay. Uh, your tangible personal property list, your TPP. So this is a list that you can include with your estate planning documents. It's incorporated by reference in your will. So your will will probably have a little paragraph that says, I may make a list of my tangible personal property. Uh, it is incorporated by reference, blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, not real complicated. And what that means is that you can include a piece of paper with your will that says, I want these items of property to go to these different people. So it's a piece of paper that you either write in your handwriting or you sign and you say, I want my grandfather clock to go to this brother. I want my jewelry to go to this daughter, that kind of thing. Um, what do I want to say? Uh, if you're worried about fraud, then maybe, like if you're worried that someone will take your list and like make changes or something, then it's not a good idea to do. But for the most part, if you just have some specific stuff that you want to give away, that's a good place to do it. You also, you don't have to do it when you do your will. You can change it or write it or whatever, kind of whenever you want to, and it's, it, you don't have to go to a lawyer or do anything. So it's, it's a really nice thing that Washington does. Okay, yeah, so you have to have the paragraph in your will referencing it to incorporate it, and then in your own handwriting you're signed. And then you have to describe the property and recipient. So you don't want to just say, my necklace. You'd want to say, my necklace with the diamonds and in the silver, whatever. Okay, you don't have one. Okay, you don't decide you get your second best bed, uh, which I say because, I guess, like Shakespeare famously left his second best bed to his wife and nothing else. So, Okay, so like I said, fraud. Uh, if you have something that has ivory in it or some sort of a piece of an endangered or threatened species, then you have to be careful how you get that because there are, uh, there are federal tax consequences. Uh, if you want to give someone a gun, there are laws that apply to guns, so you might we, you might need to give it to someone in a gun trust. So consult with a lawyer on that. And then you know, just talk to your if you have stuff that people would really value having, then talk to people about what they want so that that they you know have some sort of say in what um, in who you give what to. Okay, trusts. Okay, so the tr trust is a legal relationship uh, with property where one person the trustor gives an asset to a trustee and then it's for the benefit of the bit of the beneficiary. So the trustee might hold title to the, uh, to the assets, but the beneficiary is the actual owner. So how that might work is you might have a testamentary trust, so a trust in a will, where parents leave all of their assets to their kids, but their kids are six and seven, so they can't own property. So you get, you leave it to them in a trust, the children are the beneficiaries, so they're the actual owners of the property. But then you might put their aunt or uncle in as the trustee, so they, the aunt, aunt or uncle would own legal title to the assets. And then when the children come of age, they can receive the assets themselves. Okay, so trusts are, they're nice because they can give you a lot of control about where your, where your property goes. These are not a good candidate for DIY. Uh, tr there are a lot of different kinds of trusts and they can say and do a lot of different things. So if you do think you need a trust, this is the one piece where I would really recommend you talking to talking to a lawyer. Okay, so there are a few questions on trusts. Uh, trusts for kids, often they're testamentary trusts. So again, they're in the will. That's a way to give assets to your kids. And then you can control when they receive their assets. So they might get a payout at 21 and then or for, like for graduating from college, that at 25 when they're maybe getting married, at 30 when they're buying a new house, that kind of thing. Someone asked about living wills, so it's called an inter vivos trust. So that is a way to put your, you can put your assets in a trust that you're giving them to somebody, but you're still maintaining control over those assets. So maybe you put a bunch of money into a trust for a niece or nephew, and you make the purposes of the trust for education, because you want, you don't want to just give that person a bunch of money outright, you want them to use it for education. And that might be a way, say like you are, your estate is $3 million. So if you were to die, then Washington would impose estate taxes on your estate. Uh, so you wanna maybe decrease the size of your estate. So you maybe put a million dollars into 
a trust for nieces and nephews to spend on education. So that's sort of one use of them. Someone asked about an asset protection trust. So I think the Washington term would be like a, a credit shelter trust or a bypass trust. So if you, the Washington estate taxes are 2.13, sorry, 193 million. So if your estate is greater than $2,193,000, then estate taxes might be imposed on your estate. So you might want to decrease the size of your estate by leaving part of your money for like your spouse or your kids in a bypass trust. So you're, you're essentially, you're bypassing estate taxes. Uh, some of them are for spouses only. Those are, those have different requirements. Uh, you can do them, but I mean, you can do them for, for other family members as well. There are different ways. Yeah, that it's something you would want to talk to a lawyer about. There are also, there's a, a, a one called a Q-tip, Q-T-I-P trust where you can leave money specifically for your spouse. Those can be a little bit more flexible and can be a little bit more beneficial in terms of taxes. But like, again, you would, you would want to have someone specifically look at your situation. Um, you can also create a life estate for something where you, it might be a revocable or a permanent irrevocable trust where you put say like your house in a trust for somebody so that like what, uh, if you have two people who marry and they both are, it's the second marriage, they both already have kids. It might be that the wife owns the house, but if she dies, she wants her second husband to be able to live in the house until he dies, but she wants the house to go to her kids after that. So something like a Q-tip trust would be a way for her to leave the house to her husband, but then have the house go to the kids afterwards. And another, like another word for that is life estate. Oh, sorry, I'm talking too fast. I know I'm looking at the time and trying to get through this stuff. Okay, I will, I'll try to talk a little bit slower. Sorry. Okay, what to worry about? Just, they can get complex. Okay. Uh, durable power of attorney. So uh, Ross is right. The magic word there is durable. So if you want your power of attorney to have uh, effect after you become... Uh, incapacitated, then you have to have the word durable. So that means that it will continue to give your agent power after you're unable to speak for yourself. You can make them, you can make them effective immediately. So you can give someone immediately, like immediate power over your affairs or over your healthcare, or you can make them effective only upon incapacity. So only if you become ill and you can't speak for yourself or you need someone to help you manage your affairs. Okay, so they have to be, so the requirements, they have to be signed and dated, notarized or witnessed, but it's, if you have the witnesses there, it's probably a good idea to have, like if you have people witnessing your will, it's a good idea to have them witness your power of attorney and then have the notary who's there notarize everything as well. Uh, your, your witnesses for a power of attorney can't be family and they can't be care providers. So they have to be completely disinterested. If you don't have one, for your general or financial power of attorney, it can be really difficult and expensive for someone to have a court give them the power to manage your affairs for you. It's usually a guardianship. Uh, they're lengthy. They're invasive. It takes away a lot of your rights. And so it's not really a great option for a lot of people. It's also really expensive because your, um, your family or your friends would have to go to court and go through like the whole process of paying a lawyer and just like going through the whole court system to get the power to manage your affairs for you. So it's, it's really something you would want to avoid. And honestly, I feel pretty comfortable with a lot of the, um, the free powers of attorney that you can find on the various websites that Ross talked about. I would again, recommend using a Washington website, but I think you can get a pretty serviceable power of attorney on a lot of those sites. Uh, so what to worry about. If you have special powers, like if or special things that you would need your power, your agent and your power of attorney to do, like um, if for some reason you would want your agent to be able to gift more than the federal gift tax, gift tax exclusion amount. Uh, if you would want your, for various tax purposes, 
if you would want your agent to be able to disclaim an inheritance or to revoke a community property agreement uh, to help pay for long-term care, Medicaid planning, like if there are specific things that you're worried about, maybe towards the end of your life, then it might be a good idea to have a lawyer write your power of attorney so that some of those specific powers are included. Because a lot of times they're not included automatically. <clears throat> and those are a few of the, the powers that do have to be specifically added <clears throat> in order to um, to exist. Your healthcare power of attorney, <clears throat> same formalities. Often I just make these effective immediately because your agent can't overrule you. So if you make your husband your agent for your power of attorney for healthcare and you go to the doctor, your husband can't say, you know, I think I'd like you to have her have you cut off her legs today. You know, then you can just say, no, I don't want you to cut off my legs. So like what I'm saying is you can give someone your healthcare power of attorney to make healthcare decisions for you, but you will always be able to overrule your your agent. Okay. But it is a good idea to have someone, uh, to have one of these so that you have someone um, to make healthcare decisions. And I wanted to mention too, I had, uh, I saw a couple comments about planning an estate plan for a single person. And I really think that having the two powers of attorney are really, really important for you if you're single, because the law kind of defaults to your spouse and then like family members and stuff like that. But you might have friends that live near you who are closer to you than maybe some of your family who have a better idea of how to manage your affairs or what kind of healthcare decisions you would make. So I think that probably if you if you want to give the power to make healthcare decisions or to manage your affairs to someone who is close to you, who's not related to you, having making sure that you get your powers of attorney done is gonna be really, really important. And again, the ones that you find online are often just fine. So the requirements the same, like the signing and witnesses and everything. Um, oh, and KCLL did a great presentation on um, doing powers of attorney. So I think if you just Google that, you can you can find it. If you don't have one, so for healthcare, if you don't have one, it's not guardianship; it's called surrogacy. So the court appoints a guardian. The first person they would appoint is if you have a power of attorney, they name that person. Otherwise, spouse, kids, parents, something. But like I said, if you have a friend you think would make better decisions, then it's a really good idea to have a healthcare power of attorney. Okay, so what to worry about? I mean, it's it's fairly obvious, right? If you don't do this, then you might have someone that you don't want making decisions for you, making decisions for you. And if you don't have someone, like your family might not do what you want them to do. Okay, uh, healthcare directive. So, sorry, I see we're over our time. Let me just talk about this real quickly. Your healthcare directive is also your living will. So this, it only ever comes into effect if you're in a coma or you're in a persistent vegetative state and you can't speak for yourself. So if you can communicate at all, if you can wiggle your finger, if you can blink your, your, your eyes or anything like that, then you can communicate. So what this is, this is a really great thing to have. Um, because if you are in a coma or a persistent vegetative state and you do not want to be kept alive until the end of your, your lifespan, whatever it would be on a bunch of machines, then you need to have something like this. A doctor is not going to be able to just, you know, cut off life sustaining care. So if you want hydration, nutrition, uh, and pain medication or help breathing, then, or if you don't want those things, if you don't want to be, have your life unnaturally extended, then you want to have one of these. Um, Often the healthcare directive will say that you want pain medication, even if it hastens your death, but not causes your death, which I think can be a really important element of, um, of end of life care. And there are some great healthcare directives out there uh, from some Washington sites. So I would have no qualms about just going online and finding one. Uh, witnesses here, if you do have this, if you do this on your own and you have it witnessed, the witnesses here are even more strict. So no family, no one who might take in your will, no one who might inherit at all, no healthcare people, no doctors, no employees, the hospital, whatever. Like, so it has to be two people who are completely um, neutral, disinterested, which makes sense, right? Like if this is something that could control the end of your life, you would want it to be witnessed by somebody who, um, 
who has no stake in your in your death. So, okay. So yeah, what to worry about is just you know if you don't have one and you need one, uh, the the end of life care can be a really difficult thing. Okay, so I was just saying that. Uh, also, mental health care directives. If that if that's a concern for you, then those also exist. You can also find those online. Okay. So uh, the other documents, if you have an estate that's less than $100,000, then uh, KCLL has uh, a, a packet you can buy for uh, for doing for finishing up that estate without doing probate. Uh, let's see. I wanted to mention POLST. So a POLST is sort of similar to a living will or the healthcare directive in that it talks about end-of-life care. But uh, if you're asked to fill one of these out, please be aware that you only fill one of those out if you are very medically fragile. So if you are very close to the end of of your life. And uh, and also a pulse is not a legal document, it is a medical order from your doctor. So it's a little bit of a difference, but I do like to, to point that one out. Uh, digital property directive. Some wills will have uh, an element in them that talk about talks about how you would want someone to handle your, you know, your email accounts, your Facebook page, whatever. So if that's an important thing to you, then it can be a good idea to uh, Google around and try to find some some language that covers that. Oh, uh, I like to mention we are a death with dignity state. So if you are someone who is near the end of your life, you have less than six months to live in a terminal condition, then you can ask for help with your with hastening your death. And then it's a good idea to redo your estate planning after big life changes. Say if you suddenly like if you inherit money from your parents and suddenly you have a much larger estate or if you have a kid or if you get a divorce those kinds of things it can be a, a good idea to um to redo your estate plan okay all right i think that's all um let me just glance back up and see if there was anything that was great thanks a lot evelyn all right that was, uh, I was talking a little fast sorry about that um, I have a lot of good content. Um, somebody had asked, <clears throat> will it be better to include a piece of property in a living trust and list the trust as the owner of the property? Oh, yeah. Like, so, um, and yeah, that's a good point. You would often, if you're, say, leaving an account to a trust, you might name the uh, the trust as the, the beneficiary. Um, and like maybe it, it kind of depends on your situation and what the rest of your estate looks like and who you want to leave it to and under under what circumstances. But 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 yeah, like that that can be a really useful thing to do. Um, and then yes, you you can list the trust as the beneficiary, or you can say uh, my trustee Jane Smith, or like my you might list the beneficiary designation as to Jane Smith as trustee of my children's trust. So you're giving her the title to like your house or your accounts or whatever, but only as trustee. So you're making it clear that the person who actually owns the asset is the, the beneficiary of the trust. Um, you can include, I saw something about disposal of remains. You can include that in your will, uh, or you could just write on a separate piece of paper what you would like to have done. Uh, one thing about disposal of remains is it's uh, what's the phrase? It's more than a hope, less than a promise. So there isn't really a legal document that you can fill out that makes what is done with your body mandatory. Usually, people will do what the deceased wanted because I mean you want to follow your family member's wishes, but there wouldn't really be anyone who has legal standing to. Um, to bring anyone to account. So even just writing a letter saying, this is what I want done with my remains is, um, it's probably enough. And it is a really good idea to say something about that because you don't, like I was saying, any bad family dynamics that exist can really get brought up and exacerbated at someone's death. And so say two different kids have different ideas about what mom would want at her funeral, then it can, you can really cause a lot of difficulty. So if mom wrote down, I want to have this kind of funeral and I want, you know, I want my, my remains disposed in this way. I want my body buried in this cemetery. That can make things a lot easier for the family. 
Somebody had also asked, um, since we live in a community property state, do we need a community property form? Oh, um, no. So we live in a community property state, which means that once you get married, everything that you earn from that point on is community property. So if you get married late in life, then if you owned your house before you got married, then your house is still your separate property. Now, I say that with a little bit of a caveat because things can always change as you get married, like your new spouse might pay to put on um, an addition or pay for repairs in a substantial way. So things can change character, but the things that you have when you get married are your separate property. What a community property agreement does is if you are married to somebody and you say like you own your house but you don't have any children and you want to make sure that your house goes to your spouse and not stay to like like entirely to your spouse and not to like you know your siblings or something like that you might sign a community property agreement with your spouse saying like you're affirmatively stating all of our property is now community property so you're changing the nature of it by signing a community property agreement um, and you can also do it specifically like you can say we are changing the nature of the house to be community property but nothing else you know um yeah so there like there are there are a couple things you can do you can make it limited but that is that is one way to make all of your property community property and it's one way that people might avoid dealing with probate because if you have a spouse and you make everything community property then everything would automatically go to the spouse because you wouldn't then have any separate community and sorry you would not then have any separate property so it's, it's one, that's why it's an estate planning tool. Um, if you move to a different state, you don't have to. Um, if you move into the state, then Washington will respect your will. If you move to a different state, then that, that state should respect your Washington will. Um, and it, like you should be able to, what do I want to say? Oh yeah, so like, like formalities. Like say you move to Arizona and they have different rules for how you're supposed to sign your will. Um, if you have a Washington will and you had it signed in Washington, as long as you follow Washington's laws, then your your will should be um, should be totally legitimate. It should be fine. Um, if you have a large estate, it might not be a bad idea to redo your wills if you move to a different state, or if you're if you're particularly worried about, like, say, the um, where some of your assets are going to go. So. It can be a good idea, like your, your Washington will, will still be legitimate, but um, yeah, I think I'm just trying to, I'm thinking of like the different states that you can move to. Uh, so it, it kind of depends, I guess. Um, if you move to a different state, it might not be a bad idea to call an estate planning attorney and tell them that you're from Washington, you have a Washington will, and would they suggest redoing your will? And if you don't trust that attorney because they want your business, then you can call like, you know, two attorneys. Someone had asked, does a trust avoid probate and are the contents private? Mm, yes. Yeah. So that, that is actually another reason that people might do trusts. And I think like a lot of celebrities kind of put their stuff in trust because when you do a will, uh, it is it is filed with the court. So it's a public document. And so someone could potentially go to the courthouse and print out a copy of your will once it's been filed with the court and see where you left stuff to or who you left stuff to. Uh, so a trust would be a private document and it's not filed with the court. So that is one way of of leaving something to somebody in a more private way. Um, and yeah, it, it does avoid probate because if you put something in a trust for somebody, it goes directly to that person. But often, I feel like when people do that, there's, you always forget, people always forget something. Like there's some asset that ends up having to be probated. Um, so even if you do have a trust, it's it's not a bad idea to do a will as well, just to to catch anything that you may have forgotten to put into a trust. Lastly, somebody had added that funeral homes require um, directive regarding the preference for demise, uh, you know, a burial or cremation. And if there's not a directive, the funeral home is going to contact heirs who they say may not be the uh, the people that the person wanted to decide in the first place. So I, that is good to know. Yeah, that's and that's that's a really good point. It's just like with the healthcare directive, where you're a of, um, if you don't tell people what you want, then you might not get what you would have preferred. That's, that's that's a good point. Thank you. 
All right. Any other questions? Um, thanks for all the great questions so far, and thanks for tuning in, everybody. Um, if there's no more questions, uh, I want to thank Evelyn for all of her expertise, and thank you all for attending. And uh, keep your ear to the ground for future KCLL webinars. Mm -hmm.